what is going on everybody hope all is well hope you're having a great great marvelous good day um wanted to have a conversation and hopefully this video won't be too long and with this conversation it's the fork in the road um that's what i want to call it that's how i want to describe it and you know this is coming up because past sunday uh my pastor pastor patrick shout out to pastor patrick one of our associate pastors um, at our church, I go to a church called Winners Churches in Rosedale, Queens, if I haven't mentioned that before. Um, he gave this really great word, really, really great word. And it involved a story regarding um, a gentleman named Ron Reagan, not Ronald Reagan, the former president of the United States, but a guy named Ron Reagan, who is now a reverend or a pastor. Um, but just his story and when I heard his um, story and my pastor talked about it, I actually went online and, you know, watched an interview, N not so much because I wanted to see if what my pastor was saying is true, but I was just so fascinated by it because it, it's really a story of the fork in the road. And I remember there was this actually after service, there was a guy who young, young man who gave his life up to Christ. Oh, uh, shout out to that. And I remember I had a word for him and I spoke to him. A few people had actually had a word from him, word for him. But um, I had a word for him which sat heavy in my heart and I spoke to him after church, right? I won't really dive into too much what I told him, what I felt that God was telling me to tell him. But it was really more in a sense of it goes back to the fork in the road. And I guess it somewhat ties into what I'm, you know, the story I'm about to tell or or speak of and not saying this guy's journey or this young man's journey is the same way because I have no idea what his story is, what he's gone through, if he's going through anything or anything to that nature. But I do believe and I felt this in my spirit that I just need to share and relate the words that I have for him. And so there's this guy named Ron Reagan um, who grew up in Tennessee, the mountains of Tennessee, and when he was 12 years old, his life took a huge detour, right? He took a huge detour. Now, to give some context and some background, he grew up in a very abusive home. Um, his father abused not only himself or abused him rather, but abused his wife, which is his mom, and abused just uh, countless of other people in the family. He was a very abusive, angry guy. And so this is a household he grew up in where he felt that there was no love. He probably didn't feel like there was no stability. They grew up poor, just everything. He had a very, very troubled childhood. But when he was 12 years old, he was on his way home from school. He ran into a lady and a lady gave him a lamb. Um, not like the stuffed toy lamb, but an actual lamb, like the animal. And he took that lamb in and basically formed a strong bond and relationship with that lamb just like how you know we do with dogs he did the same thing with this lamb and the lamb gravitated towards him that lamb basically became like his best friend and so the lamb would actually wait for him when he would come home from school and just so forth and one day he was on his way home he got home he could see his dad working in working on his car but he could tell his dad was very angry and upset which wasn't anything out of the ordinary. So what he did, he wanted to avoid that because he didn't want to be a victim of his dad's wrath because his dad was very angry, very aggressive, like I said, very abusive um, in their household. So he went, uh, he went around the house, but when he went around the house, he saw his lamb on the ground covered in blood. Basically his lamb was dead. His dad murdered his lamb. And so that, flipped the switch inside of him that basically transformed his life and transformed who he was after that. he became a very angry dark individual at a very young age he became very angry he became very um hateful especially anything that represented authority so he goes to his dad um well he he realized like his dad is the one who killed his lamb i guess the lamb must have wanted to spend time or maybe went up to the dad or whatever while he was doing what he was doing and the dad killed him. So he ran away from home and, you know, all that stuff. Um, he just did. He had a serious, seriously deep hatred or a serious deep hatred for his father. 
And so now we fast forward to the age about, I think he said around 25 years old. He's married. He has a couple of kids, but he's a carbon copy of his father. He said, basically like he abuses his wife, abuses his kids, um, just living a very dark life, been in and out of um, doing alcohol and I'm assuming maybe drugs, maybe I'm not really sure, but I know he definitely talked about just, you know, be being very influenced in, in alcohol and just living a very dark life. They didn't know anything about God. They didn't know anything about the Bible. They didn't really care to, they didn't really care if he lives or die. He has zero fear, zero fear in his life, running around with the wrong crowd, just getting involved in just a lot of just crazy things. Just his life is just going in a path of a path of destruction. And so he goes into 7-Eleven and while he's walking in, there's a guy who's walking out, right? But they're at the door. And, you know, when you're walking in, you're walking out the door, you only really really can push it just pretty much one way if somebody's coming in and somebody's going out. And I guess for whatever reason, maybe like he couldn't get through or the other way around, but his anger took place, right? When his anger took place, he attacked the guy. He basically punched the guy in the face and knocked him down. The guy falls, he falls into a pile of bottles, glass bottles rather, um, and he gets up, right? Because he's like, yo, I'm just, he's just, I'm just an angry person. I'm, I'm very explosive. Like I'm quick to react off of anything. Like anger is my first reaction, which comes along with violence. And so the guy who he knocks down gets up, grabs a piece of the glass bottle and, a, and attempts to, to stab him in the face. But while he's about to stab him in his face, he, Ron, I'm going to call him Ron, um, lift his arms up and he tries to block his face from being stabbed by this glass bottle. Also not knowing that this guy who he knocked down just got out of prison or was in prison before, right? And so he did that. He blocks it, but he gets stabbed by his bicep. And when he gets stabbed by his bicep, he um, the glass bottle or where he gets stabbed, it hits an artery. So you know what happens when you hit an artery? You're going to bleed and you're going to bleed like like it's no tomorrow. Um, so he's just bleeding out of control. He said he could feel his arm getting numb, but he's still fighting this guy. So they're going back and forth, fighting, fighting, fighting. His adrenaline is like kicking in. Um, he's just going at it, not really caring what's taking place, what's going to happen to him. Probably doesn't even care if he's going to live or die at that moment. He just knows that he just wants to attack and basically harm this guy. And so the manager comes out of the convenience store and sees what's going on and tells him to stop. But he also tells Ron that, hey, if you don't get to the hos- if you don't get to a hospital, you're going to die. And so I, I guess that switch clicked to him and it was like, OK, I need to get to the hospital. So the guy actually offers to take Ron to the hospital. So on the way to the hospital, he's in out of consciousness. He's putting pressure in his arm to, you know, kind of help prevent the bleeding. But at the same time, he said he, it's not like he really cared too much. Right. He was just doing what he had to do, I guess, just to survive at that moment. But he doesn't really care if he lives or die because his whole life has just been full of darkness, pretty much, and just anger. And so he gets to the hospital. When he gets to the hospital, he's pretty much out of it, right? He's in and out of consciousness. He's near death. But he said he can hear the doctor saying that he's going to die. If he doesn't get the medical attention he needs, he's going to die. So he's basically close to death. So they decide to transport him to a different hospital because I guess the hospital they were at doesn't necessarily have the equipment or the medical care that's going to be needed to help save his life. I'm assuming he probably had to go to like a a trauma unit or be like a level two or three trauma unit or something like that. But anyways, so he's in an ambulance and I believe they were heading to, I want to say Knoxville, Tennessee, maybe, or, uh, or maybe Nashville. I'm not, I don't really remember. Um, But they're heading towards over there. And while he's in there, the paramedic that he's in the um, in the ambulance with tells him um, that, hey, you need to know you need to know God. He said he's not sure why the paramedic told him that, because typically and I work in healthcare, So this part is 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 true. Definitely. You're not really supposed to kind of like share your beliefs like that. The reason why, because you may offend, like, let's say, you know, you are a Christian, but you're saying this to somebody who is Muslim, right? Or Jewish or, or just whatever different faith you may offend. So it's just to kind of like the hospital just to kind of protect itself. Really, you know, they kind of do not encourage somebody doing that, but 
for whatever reason the guy did it which i believe it was god and so he the guy tells him this the paramedic tells him this and he you know he gets upset because anything that involves authority his first reaction is anger so he said he starts cursing at the guy and everything um and then the guy tells him again it's like you need to know who jesus you need to know jesus and he he goes off again cursing at the guy and he even curses jesus He's like, yo, at this time, I don't know anything about God or Jesus or anything like that, but I just know that anything that involves authority, because it represents his dad, anger is the first reaction. And you know what I'm saying? Anger and violence. And so he, he starts cursing and just going off. And then he said, all of a sudden, he hears this loud boom, like an explosion. And he hears this explosion. And he said, all he sees is smoke, right? Dark, dark smoke. But he said he could feel his body, which was really his spirit, being lifted up, right? And he said he he sees he feels his body lifting up, and he said all he could see is just smoke, like a dark smoke. And he just feels his life, or not his life, but his body just being lifted up. So his body is moving, or his spirit is moving, rather. And he's going through this cloud of dark smoke. And then all of a sudden, he sees a um a, 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 the mouth of he said it looks like a mouth of a volcano so just imagine seeing like the mouth of a volcano and he sees his body looks like i guess it's um descending down towards the mouth of this volcano what it looks like basically he is descending to hell and he said as he's getting closer and closer down he said that he can hear voices but the voices sound very familiar and the voices that he are he's hearing are People that he grew up with, his friends, people he fought with, he got drunk with, did whatever with drugs, maybe whatever the case may be, uh, committed whatever type of crimes. But he said he could hear their voice and it gets getting louder and louder. And he said they're his, these are voices that of his friends and they're telling him, Ron, get away, Ron, get away. Don't come here. Don't come here. Turn around. Do not come here. Come here. Um, if you come here, you're not going to be able to escape. And he said he could just sense like he's like that was even like the worst part because like you're just seeing just flames and fire and all this other stuff. And mind you, he said like he's doesn't know anything about hell, doesn't know anything about heaven, doesn't know anything about God or Jesus, Satan or whatever it is. But this is clearly he sees like, yo, I'm about to go to hell. This is what probably hell looks like. And he said he could, he's like the worst part of that experience was the sense of like it just felt very depressing and felt very um like just misery just misery um and he was just like you could just sense it and he said he, he had he kept on smelling this horrible smell it smelled like sulfur he said it was like the worst smell that he's ever smelled um and he was just like you know it it it, it that kind of shook them for somebody. And he said that he was somebody who had no fear, no fear at all. He didn't fear anything. He didn't really care about anything. He had zero fear. And then he said, all of a sudden he wakes up and he's laying, when he wakes up, he's laying in the hospital, hospital bed. His wife is laying next to him and there's a doctor and his wife is basically telling him like, Hey, um, they were going to amp amputate your arm, but they were able to save it. All this stuff. And basically, um, he survived, Right. He survived. I guess they did surgery, they did whatever it is, and he was able to survive. What took place was that God saved him. God gave him another chance, right? So here's a man who grew up in a household, um, became a product of his environment because his dad was abusive, not only to him, but to his mom and to everybody. And a traumatic experience took place where he lost what was his best friend, that lamb and it shaped his whole life and then which it, it you know it made him live a life of just anger and and and, and depression and just not caring whether he live or die no purpose in life whatever took place and you know there's a lot of us who kind of go through that path like fork in the road and it looks like he got to a point in his life at the age of 25 where there was a fork in the road and god gave him a second chance because he survived because god could have said you know what that's it you, you just cursed me. I had somebody tell you, probably from me, to tell you like, hey, you need to know who I am. This is your chance. 
and you curse me. So I'm, sh I'm going to show you, this is where you're going to end up for eternity. There is no getting out. Once you reach hell, once you reach there, you're done. You see all the friends, all your friends and voices, not by accident, like the voices that you're hearing are familiar voices. It's not by accident. Those voices are also talking to you and telling you, do not come here. You don't want to be here. And so now fast forward, and I'm not sure he didn't really explain because this is, this is off an interview. So my pastor preaches, he talked about this guy and gave the story. And I went in and actually watched this guy's interview because it was just so fascinating to me. And he he doesn't really say from the time that he was in a hospital and when he got saved, but basically one day his wife got saved. And so his wife's going to church. And then one day he decides to go to church with his wife. He gets to church. And, you know, at this point, he's like, yo, I still don't know, like, anything about God too much. You couldn't tell me, you know, if you gave me a scripture, I couldn't say if it's a scripture or not. You know, he's not, he's not really familiar with just God and the Bible and just all that it comes with. And so he's at service. And then the pastor says something that caught his attention that just clicked. The pastor mentions the son of lamb or the lamb of God. And it clicked to him. And he said, that point on, he made a decision. He gave himself up to Christ. Because that lamb, remember, he was given a lamb when he was 12 years old. 12 years old, he was given this lamb and it was murdered. And so he still had this special connection because he said up until that point, he just lived a life of darkness. And ironically, after he had that experience of almost going to hell, he said that for the longest, he could not be in the dark at all. He said that was the first time in his life that he was ever scared. He actually had fear. But sometimes what happens is with some of us is that we can be very fear, fearless because of what we, the, the environment we grew up in or what we've gone through. And we kind of have this like this chip on our shoulder or we put our guards up and just we live a life of anger, jealousy, aggression. Um, you know, we just do not care about any and anybody. We don't even care about ourselves. We don't care if we live or die, but it comes to where we have to make a decision that fork in the road. And so God had a purpose for him, just like he has a purpose for each and every single one of us. We all have a purpose. It doesn't matter what we've gone through, what we experience and what we are dealing with. We all have a purpose in life. And sometimes life will throw us, throw us that curveball and we lose sight of it because the enemy wants us to think that we're no good, that God doesn't love us. Like, why are we experiencing all these traumatic experiences, all this heartbreak, all this hurt if God really loves us, right? But it's not God who's causing this stuff to happen. It's, you know, Satan. Satan is Satan is the God of the world, right? Satan is the God of the world. And so his job is to cause what we see today constantly of just suffering and misery and poverty and all these things and, and make us think sometimes that it is God that is causing all this. So it's like, you know, you must just live your life the way you want to live your life. Who cares? You know what I'm saying? You know, you can stab your brother in the back. You commit. You could. You you could go out and commit adultery. You could go go ahead and um out there and just commit drive bys and 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 murder and rape and all these different things. Things that we see that's going on, or just not live a life that represents God. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that we have to live a perfect life because God never calls us to live a perfect life because He knows that we were made imperfect. But that's the reason why Jesus died on the cross. So sin will no, longer, will no longer be a prisoner of sin. We can actually just go to him and ask for mercy and forgiveness, right? And and that's the key thing. And so, but it comes to by it comes by making a decision, that fork in the road. And what decision are we going to go left or are we going to go right? What are what what are we going to do? Because the choices that we make, we don't realize the impact it's going to have and how it can really shape the rest of our life. Because there's more to life than just what we see on earth. And that's what he said. He said he didn't realize, it made him realize the life that he was living, he was living without purpose. And, but there's more to way, the way he was living. And so then now after he gets saved, you know, he goes in and becomes a devoted believer, then he becomes a pastor. And then now he pastors four different churches. 
he's four different churches. He's a senior pastor of four different churches. And to my understanding, he also travels all across the U.S. and probably across the world, the world telling this story. And he even said it during this interview, like it was a, it's still a challenge for him to tell some of this, you know, what took place in his life, because that is very, it's, it's traumatic. It really, really is. It really, really is. But we all have a decision to make on, are we going to allow our past circumstances to be our future life. And we don't want that. We want to live a life to where we can take what we've gone through, what we've been through and not be a product of it anymore and live a life that represents the future that we want to have, not only for ourselves, but also for our kids, the generation that's coming up. Because there's more to than just us just living carefree. And this is not a, 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 a video where I'm here to judge or here to knock on how anybody's living because at the end of the day, we all have a story. We all have a path, a past, including myself. But this is just to help those who may be at the end of their rope or has reached the end of the road, the fork in the road, and needs to make a decision. Because just imagine if God was like, nah, you had your chance. That's it. It's over. Sorry, I can't help you. But he was given that second chance. He was given that second chance, not only from himself, but to help save others. So I wanted to share this message to those who are watching, to those who are listening, that, hey, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, you're, you're never too far gone for God to save you. Never. It doesn't matter what you have done or what people say, because what people say has nothing to do with what God's God's promise and future that he has for your life. You don't have to live off of fear. We don't have to live off of anger. Right. You, we can flee from the satanic ways that, that Satan wants us to think and believe that. Yeah, I'm going to live a life of misery. I'm going to live a life of depression because this is all I know. No. So we have to resist the enemy. We have to resist Satan. Resist Satan and he will flee from you, as the Bible says. Right? You have to flee from him. Do not get caught up into his lies. Don't do not get caught up into his wicked web and ways because all he wants to do is kill, steal, and destroy your life and all those around you. He wants to take away God's promise from you, but he can't. But he can make you think that you're not worthy of it. And that you're not deserving of it because of what you experienced and what your life is like. You don't have to live a life of fear. You don't have to live a life of fear. God, is, God does not give us the spirit of fear, but he gives us the power and love and a sound mind. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven. So just trust in God and make that decision. I guarantee you won't regret it, man. So his story was powerful. If, if you want to see it, I'll leave a link down below. Um, and so you could watch this phenomenal story about a man who felt like he lost everything, including himself, but gained so much more the moment he turned his life around. So this is just a little appetite. Again, you know, season two is coming soon. Don't forget to make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel, The Wild Podcast, The Words of Wisdom Podcast. And I will be coming back with, um, there's so much I want to talk about. I have guests that are lined up and that's what's, you know, and that, that's, what's going to make season two very, very much different. Um, because I want it to be more of an interactive, um, season and I have some really great episodes and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking at talking to you guys again. And I really appreciate all the love and the support. Thank you so, so much, you know, for just continuing to rock with me. And I thank you and I wish you nothing but greatness, health, wealth, and all the promises and riches that God has for your life. Until the next time I see you and talk to you, one love.